Wrong tree, stop barking up it. So there's this craze that's been going around Instagram for the past few weeks. AI generated portraits. What a world to live in. And they looked gorgeous. I didn't think we'd get this far this fast, but maybe that's why my real intelligence is going to be suppressed by the robots by 2080. And hey, maybe I deserve it. Anyway, curiosity got the better of me, and before I knew it, I was sitting on the loo paying 2 dollars for 100 auto-generated portraits of myself based on 20 selfies I uploaded and in 17 minutes they were on my phone. Uh, not all of them were a success. Some of them were very pretty women but not me and some of them were well pfft, I was kind of flabbergasted. Am I hot? Of course anything I find fun I have to overthink and ruin for myself so here are the subsequent questions I have about my AI portraits. The question I had was, where are they getting this art from? Because AI is just coding, it has to draw from somewhere. From whence, well, was it drawing? The New York Times had an answer for me. They're built by scraping millions of images from the open web, then teaching algorithms to recognize patterns and relationships in those images and generate new ones in the same style. That means that the artists who upload their work to the internet will be unwittingly helping to train their algorithmic competitors. <gasps> so this is interesting to me because it sounds like they're not drawing from any specific artist but drawing like mean, median and mode averages from what artists perceive make a portrait work. Part of my mind is like, isn't that what creative people do anyway? All of my writing, because I'm a poet, is probably subconsciously a collation of everything that I have read filtered through my code. There's no way to really trace it back and the sheer volume of like intellectual ancestors makes it kind of redundant because what makes it unique is that it's filtered through me. Very different from like directly copying or stealing. There's a whole book about that here. It's very good, the difference between the two. But as a socialist, and don't you be scared of that word, it just means sharing. People need to stop getting out of their pram about that. Untwist your knickers. As a socialist, I feel very nervous about what we automate. My sewing journey, can we call it a sewing journey now? I think it's a sewing journey. Teaching myself to sew really made me think about the things that I automated in my life that actually when I do them myself and when I immerse myself in the process, I see the difference between something that has been in my mind automated, but on closer inspection is unautomatable. Maybe not in the results to the untrained eye, but in its spirit in its essence. I've talked about this idea of aping wealth before Hannah Louise Poston put me onto it, but this kind of learned default to want to feel wealthy, to own more clothes than we can possibly get wear out of, buying star constellations or plots of land, side note, established titles, the people who sell a little bit of Scottish land so you can call yourself a lord or a lady, approached me to sponsor a video and this was my response. Wrong tree, stop barking up it. And as that follows, getting your portrait painted. Now if you've ever gone on a guided tour of like an art gallery or something you'll know that it was very rare for anybody who weren't the 0.2% in history to get their portraits painted. It says I am important enough that somebody should spend 10,000 hours recording my facial features and even with the prominence of photography very rich people and people who just like art and would like to commission something off Etsy still want to do it. It says I have held somebody's attention for that long. There is more of me to capture than can be captured in a photo. And I'm not saying that's wrong, I think that's actually true of everyone. And for that reason it's kind of magical that normal people like you and me get to have that done. I'm not saying that the instinct for it to exist is inherently evil, but I do think accepting it is a kind of like collective self-medication or coping mechanism to avoid what we really need to do. You know what I'm gonna say don't you? What we need is revolution! No, but seriously, what do we miss when we let computers make art about us? This is my friend Sophie. She's a really incredibly talented artist. And recently she sat down with me and my partner Craig to listen to the stories of our life together and record it in a bespoke bit of art that I got printed onto a silk scarf. Isn't it bloody beautiful? Also, if you want to commission them, you can get them below. That's not the point of the video, but I wouldn't be surprised if you wanted one. And that experience reminded me that art is a communication. Computers can't 
listen to us. They can't hear the parts of us that don't show up in our faces or in CCTV or in posed pictures of us and the people we care about. Everyone deserves to have an experience like that, but because we haven't yet brought about the dream of sharing on a mass scale, some might call that socialism, but who am I to label it? We don't get the real meat behind what is a personalized portrait, which is, I have seen you, you have been seen, you deserve to be recorded. I also wanted to say that while most of these women are very pretty, lots of them look really nice, these women who were me and at once not me have all had something kind of uniform altered by the robots. They have made my nose smaller, made my eyes a little bit wider, made my lips more full and on the whole, to be honest, made me thinner. I would be lying to say that when I got these portraits through, I just rolled my eyes and was like, oh, beauty standards and the filtering age, am I right? I was also kind of like, should I look like that? Could I look like that? And that's where I realized we get into the territory of empathy and emotional intelligence, which the AI lacks. I'd like to think that if I did get a human to draw this, uh, or at least the kind of artist that I would commission, they wouldn't do that. They'd celebrate the features that I had and use the old fashioned artistic license to interpret how I looked rather than using the conformity standard that these robots have obviously scanned the internet for and internalized. Look, I have a Google Home and while we've had some great times together, I wouldn't call her in a heartbreak emergency. And no offense, but I think she'd be pretty shit on a hen do. One is clearly not a replacement for the other. And while I think making art accessible is really cool, I mean, I give away most of what I make on the internet for free. It's very different when you consent to it. I think the intellectual property is like a great survival technique for artists living under capitalism but ultimately in the future I'd love to move towards like a more creative commons model. I think that would be much better for everybody. So I'm not against things that would otherwise be inaccessible to people being accessible, it's just the way we make something accessible isn't necessarily not paying the people who made it. <laughs> I've noticed that capitalism bends and grows tactics around what we can't afford rather than fixing why we can't afford it. Have you used AI like this? If you're an artist, is AI inspiring for you or terrifying? In an ideal world, what would be a cool compensation model so people can enjoy these new emerging forms of art and artists can still get paid? I would love to hear in the comments below. This video has been made possible by the Gumption Club who tip me per free video so I can keep giving away the free videos. Love that for us. The future is Patreon. If you like this video, I reckon you might like some of these videos and make Make sure that you're subscribed so you don't miss another ramble in the woods with me. Unmissable, I think you can agree. Frog snog out.